So our uh, picture that we have to start with here is a beaver dam. Sherry and I were just discussing. Um, I'll have to let you know later because I don't have perfect recollection of where that was, but it is one of those exceptional and beautiful pictures uh, that you get to see uh, a home where beavers have built it. It looks like this one needs a little bit of repair. So I just want to thank Sherry for her ministry and the beautiful picture she brings to us. Also, I would like to say that um, y please keep in mind that we are not trying to do an exhaustive study. That our intent here is to do an introduction, to give you a taste, to send you on a journey to dig deeper and study more. Revelation 11 may well be, as some would argue, and I don't disagree with them, maybe the most complicated chapter in the entire book. So um, I'm going to try to make this simple. You are going to hear a number of new things you have not heard before. All right. Uh, we are still in the interlude on this. So God has unfolded these things to John about the sixth trumpet. Then he goes into chapter 10 and 11 with this beautiful interlude to put a magnifying glass on the events that are going to transpire. So Revelation 11, 10 and 11 takes us through the beginning and the things that laid the foundation for the medieval church, the changes of authority, the changes of things that begin to take place. We'll talk about later on in some of the texts. And to magnify this interlude, and then our next presentation, which is still in chapter 11, will be the seventh trumpet. Okay, so I hope you enjoy this, and uh, let's look at the interlude. Uh, I'm going to begin with an unusual slide, as my editor has said. So uh, let's begin here. Renko Stefanovich, in his commentary on Revelation, which I'm using uh, two commentaries and a collection of papers written uh, in the mid-1980s. Uh, Dr. Jan Paulson and others are some of the material that I, I, I don't actually quote verbatim, but are part of my frame of reference. Uh, that's called Symposium on Revelation Volumes 1 and 2. And so listen to what uh, I just made a note here from Stevanovich. In his commentary on Revelation observed in verse 1 of chapter 11, the following sequence. The verse says the sanctuary, which is the heavenly temple, the altar and worshiper, parallels the Day of Atonement language in Leviticus in the same sequence. When you see things that are virtually identical, it's like a marker. And when you have a marker, that marker is a reference point so that when you do broaden your search out into the rest of Scripture, you will find another marker that matches it. So at the end of chapter 11 and verse 19, it looks into the most holy compartment, okay, and it reveals there the Ark of the Covenant in the Most Holy Compartment, which is only accessible on the Day of Atonement. So we have Atonement, Day of Atonement language in verse 1, and then in verse 19 of chapter 11, we have clear message of Day of Atonement language. Day of Atonement was a day of preparation, maybe uh, putting away of all sin, and preparation for exciting and wonderful things to happen. So with that introduction, I would like to get on to chapter 11, verse 1. And each one of these slides will give us the text, and then underneath are my notes, so you see what I see, and if you need to go back this two or three times, uh, then you also have a copy of my notes. So here's verse 1. Then there was given me, John wrote, a measuring rod like a staff. Someone in one commentary said that a reed could be as much as 10 feet long. And someone said, back to the text, get up and measure the temple of God, here's the sequence, and the altar and those who worship in it. Now, this could not be the earthly temple because it was, it was destroyed almost 20 years ago. So this can't be the earthly temple. So this would have to be John looking into the heavenly temple. 
The altar of incense is inside of the temple, and John is to measure just the inside of the temple, the whole inside. This measurement has two potential meanings to it. First of all, it's an evaluation of the people inside. It says, get up and measure the temple and those who worship in it. Now, how do you worship in that temple? You would have to be following Jesus wherever he goes. So John is going to take this rod and he's going to measure those who follow Jesus. And the result is that it is doing two things, potentially. Establishing a sense of their assurance and their assurance in the judgment. So remember I said that worship is an, the major theme over the entire book. Who do you worship and how do you know? is absolutely essential to understand that theme throughout the book. So now John is measuring the worshipers, and I'm going to ask the obvious question. Are you following the Lamb wherever he goes? It's an ultimate question, isn't it? Are you going to be measured in the temple? Because when we talk about the outside, that's a whole other story. In verse 2, it says, Leave out the court which is the outside of the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 prophetic months. 42 months. It says they will tread, they will trample underfoot the holy city. Now remember, it's the courtyard of the temple, and it's also in the same verse, the holy city. So trampling down of the outer court would be those on the outside who are in opposition to the gospel message in a way that brings about persecution for the believers who live by faith in Christ. So we're talking about here this 42-month period of time, prophetic time. So I'm going to give you a little class in understanding prophetic time. Okay, so there is a biblical principle God uses to help, help us understand prophetic time, and I'm going to give you two witnesses to that reality. The first one is found in Numbers 14, verses 34 and 35. It says, according to the number of days that you spied out the land, 40 days, for every day you shall bear your guilt a year, even 40 years, and you will know my opposition. So the children of Israel had to suffer the consequences of this judgment for 40 years. Now, I want you to notice in Ezekiel chapter 4, it says, you, Ezekiel, shall lay down a second time. The first time, you want to go back and read this story carefully. See how many days he laid the first time on his side. You're in for a shock. You shall lie down a second time, but on your right side, in other words, he was on the left side previously, and bear the iniquity of the house of Judah. I have assigned it to you for 40 days, a day for each year. So a day for a year of prophetic judgment applies in the book of Revelation. Now, I also want you to understand that this 42 months parallels a marker found in the book of Daniel. Remember what I said about markers? That those markers tie things together to answer the mystery that you find in the book of Revelation. You cannot correctly interpret the book of Revelation without finding the markers in the book of Daniel that will tell you the events taking place leading up to this time of trampling down the outer court, the holy city. Daniel 7 is essential, okay? And listen to Daniel 7. I'm going to read verses 23 to 26. I'm picking up in the middle of the chapter, okay? And I'm not going to fully explain Daniel because that is another presentation, but I want to give you a context. The fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms. This would be pagan Rome. And will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. Now that word tread is a familiar word, isn't it? But as for the ten horns on this fourth beast, out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise, and another will arise after them, and he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. 
He will, in Daniel, notice what it says, speak out against the Most High, wear down the saints of the highest one, and he will intend to make alteration in times and in law, that would be God's law, and they will be given into his hands for a time, times, and a half of times. So, let me explain what's on this slide. A time, times, and a half a time is a Jewish way of reckoning time. In prophecy, a prophetic month is 30 days. So, a time would be, in Jewish language, an idiom representing a year, or 360 days, or 12 months. 360 days would be 360 years. And then the word times would be multiple years or two years, that would be an additional 720 days or years, which would be 24 months. And a half a time would be a half of a year, 180 days, which would be six months. So if you add up 12, 24, and 6, it comes out 42 months. If you add up one year, two years, and a half a year, it comes up with 1,260 uh, 1, days of years a prophetic time of persecution. A principle of time in prophecy speaks of a period of 42 months and 1,260 days of years. They are all the same period of time in Daniel and in Revelation. These time markers tie together Daniel and Revelation. It is no coincidence that they come up to the same amount of time. It is just too obvious. Going on to Revelation 11, verse 3. And I will grant authority of my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for one, for 1260 days, that's days of years, clothed in sackcloth. So the 42 months are the same, <clears throat> same as 1260 days of years. The prophetic messengers are humble and are speaking God's truth, listen carefully, during this 1,260 years of prophetic time, as the mainstream religion takes on more of the character of man and less of the character of Christ and the Heavenly Father. What am I trying to say? That these two witnesses are humble, and in spite of what the church chooses to do, the Word of God with humility continues to reveal the truth of God so that as we do church, we can go back to the authority of the Word and say, are we in harmony with the truth of Scripture? So understand that God, as the church is growing and developing, starting in that 4th, uh, 5th century era, okay, are we seeing the church being consistent with the scriptures, or are we seeing man beginning to reinterpret and create the church in its own image, the image of humans, and sometimes stepping far away from God? And I'm going to say that this is a reality for every church and every denomination. It does not matter who they are or what the name of the church is. But here we have a specific period of time so why two witnesses? John is appealing to the Jewish legal system in the vision, especially in light of a possible judgment. I have three texts you want to pay careful attention to. I'm going to begin with Hebrews because Hebrews is a book of speaking to the Hebrew Christian. Notice what Paul writes, and I happen to believe Paul is the author of Hebrew. Okay, Hebrews. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two witnesses. That's verse 28, verse 29. How much more severe the punish, money, punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insult, insulted the Spirit of grace? Now here's what I want to say. We have that trampling underfoot the Son of God sound familiar to chapter 11? Has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant, which is atonement language by which we're sanctified, and has insulted the spirit of grace. Okay? 
Now, Deuteronomy 17, verse 6. On the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses, he who is to die shall be put to death. He shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. Notice Deuteronomy 19, 15, and 16. A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. In other words, in Jewish law, there needed to be two witnesses to speak against a crime. So notice in this interlude, we're introduced to two witnesses to testify about who is in the temple and who is not in the temple. Are you with me on this? Very simple, isn't it? Let's look at verse 4. The two witnesses are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. So I actually, you know, my minor was in there. I actually did a sketch of this. And so what I did is put two olive trees up and then I took and designed a tube coming out of the tree pouring oil into a lamp. Oil is always symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Olive oil, hence the fruit, produces a fabulous oil, good for your health, by the way, but it's also symbolic of the Holy Spirit. But the two lampstands, I put down here as the Old and the New Testament, but I don't leave it just the Old and, two test, old and New Testament alone because someone had to have a voice to be speaking the words of the Old and New Testament. Those in the inner temple are witnesses and are secure who have been faithful to the Word of God and proclaimed the Word of God, and they followed the Lamb wherever He goes. Verse 5, And if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemy. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. All right, now there is a final judgment, which is fire. This confirms the power and the authority of the Word of God and the consequences of rejecting the Word. But there's more. These have the power to shut up the sky so that the rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. They have the power over waters to turn them to blood and strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. These reference two Old Testament stories, Moses and the plagues of Egypt, and Elijah, who stopped the rain for three and a half years. This is the power of the Word of God. These two men were a demonstration that when they spoke the Word, it had the power to affect creation, because it wasn't Moses' Word, it was not Elijah's words, it was the Word of God has power and it has authority. That should cause us, as we look at chapter 11, to understand that the Word of God has authority that rises above our opinions. Think of that for a few minutes. When they finish their testimony, their proclamation, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. Now, the Dark Ages lasted 1,260 years. It ends with the rise of the French Revolution. It was founded by Alexander Weislop, and that revolution abolished religion for three and a half years, experimenting with a truly atheistic society creating a 10-day work week which almost broke the working class of France. Atheism is that beast that ascends up out of the abyss, and it wreaked havoc and destruction and facilitated a hugely violent and, 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 and I'm sorry, an immoral society. In verse 8, it says, The two witnesses, their dead bodies, will lie in the streets of the great city, which is mystically called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. You see, the French Revolution tossed religion for a hedonistic society and immorality prevailed. Sodom is a symbol of immorality, the story of Lot. Egypt denied the God of heaven, which is atheism, or may I say, paganism. 
because the French created a woman as their goddess, and that's atheism slash paganism. And understand, atheism and paganism are always connected because atheism is the worship of man, or in France in this case, the goddess of reason, a woman. But it was still a pagan creation of their own goddess in which they chose to worship. There is no real huge difference between paganism and atheism. Both have a god they choose to worship. Verse 9. Those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in the tomb. This experiment would last for three and a half days. Now, there's a, a principle that says that if the time period appears to be symbolic, you should consider it symbolic, but if it appears to be literal, it should be literal. So, I'm going to get to that in just a moment, but notice my notes here. The whole world can look at and back on the experiment and see what was done and what the results were. Today, atheism is prevalent and still rejects religion. It can sometimes be tolerant of religion, but never accept religion as necessary or needed within culture and society. But there is more. Those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate. They will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. In other words, the rejection of God is torment. Did you catch that? For those who reject it. They have no moral compass. They have no guidance. There is no such thing as wrong. There's no such thing as sin. There's no such thing as judgment or God. This captures the spirit of France in rejecting religion. That rejection was the result of religious abuse from the medieval church. Gloating and celebrating their victory of killing religion, a result, if you would, of abusive religion. And I'm going to say this again. Of all the people I know that have forfeited Christianity, who have walked away, who have chosen to be atheists, have done so because of either in their home or have had an experience with church leadership that was a violation of principle. And it impacted them so strongly they said, if that's a representation of God, I want nothing to do with it. And here the leadership of France chose because of the misappropriation of authority and power of the medieval church, tossed religion out. Abusive religion is the one thing that produced atheism. And you can look at the role of the Eastern Church in Russia and its abuse favoring the, uh, what do I want to say, the wealthy and the rich to the neglect of the poor brought about the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia as it brought about the French Revolution in France. Religious abuse is alive and well in churches today. And this needs to be a message understood by pastors and elders and laity. Anyone connected to the church needs to understand that any abuse is a misrepresentation of the truth of God. In fact, the abuse was so great, it says here in verse 10, there was a huge celebration. They, they sent gifts to one another because they had done away with the abuse of religion. But I'm going to say that the Word of God and the Gospel is a contradiction and exactly the opposite of abuse of religion. Verse 11, after three and a half days, the breath of life from God came unto them, or into them. They stood up on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. Now, I want you to notice something. This is why we say this is the end of the 1,260 years. By decree, France abolished religion. November 26, 1793 to June 17, 1797, three and a half years approximately, 
when France removed the restrictions. Their society was collapsing. People were getting broken health from the 10-day work week because they did away with the celebration of worship day by creating a 10-day week. The need to give religious freedom back in France came as a shock. It says, great fear fell upon those who were watching them as the freedom of religion was restored and society began to move back to a healthy, balanced society instead of a hedonistic, free-for-all, do-what-you-will society. Verse 12, and they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, come up here. They went up to heaven in the cloud and their enemies were watching them. The message of justification by faith was given a divine resurrection and restoration by the breath of God, giving it fresh air, the Spirit, and fresh power, the Holy Spirit. This was not to be the religion that was abolished, but to return as something greater. Instead of a religion of duty and works, understand in the Dark Ages the religious wars that took place, the persecutions that took place, the heretics that were put to death that took place, what God resurrected and gave power to to return was to be something full of God's grace, God's mercy, and the salvation by faith alone in Jesus Christ instead of the abusive religion of the historic church. That's good news. And in that hour there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell Keep in mind, in Daniel, we read about the ten kings. France was one-tenth of those ten kings because it is one of the ten kings that rose up on the head of the fourth beast. 7,000 people were killed. Uh, 7,000 could be a symbolic of the people who were faithful that were put to death in the revolution. And the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. A great earthquake connects us to the sixth seal as a parallel, pointing us down to the end of time. The rise of the gospel in the 19th century began to spread globally as the study of prophecy restored the understanding of the gospel. Salvation by faith alone began to move across all denominations. There was a thing called the great religious awakening that has never been repeated since. In other words, Coming out of that dark period of time, the light of redemption and salvation brought a new light that said, you know what, if you're in a religion that's controlling and abusive, you need to rethink where you're at. Because the God of heaven is a God of mercy and grace and agape unconditional love. And if your church is not standing for the love of God in these last days, you need to rethink, why am I here? Why, why is the church trying to control me? Am I under the influence of the authority of Scripture? Am I under the influence of the authority of the Holy Spirit? Am I following the Lamb wherever He goes? Even as He ascended from His resurrection and is in the temple of heaven, am I willing to go, as Paul wrote in Ephesians, that we are high and lifted up and seated with God. God sees us as already in that temple with him. Are you there is an important question. Huh. Well, we just came to the end of our presentation. Oregon Beach, Oregon Coast is a spectacular and beautiful place. Bottom right corner, I don't know if it shows up on your screen, there's, there's lovely family, there's probably starfish in that pond. And Sherry just happened to snap that picture and the fog is just beginning to move off the coast, still just a little bit around those giant stacks out there. Kind of gives you a little bit of a perspective. And I want you to notice all the white that's covering the rocks. It did not snow that day. But those massive stacks out there is a resting place for the birds that collect there and nest there. And that's what they leave behind. Uh, anyway, I just happen to think this is one of my favorite pictures that Sherry has ever taken. Uh, the color and those stacks were just so spectacular that day. But I also want to say this, that God has a place for you to come and rest. He has his day of rest. He has his son who says, come unto me, 
all ye that are heavy laden, heavy laden and labor, and I will give you rest. See, that's the message that from the 1790s, the end of the 1790s, that begin to emerge in the gospel and move throughout the world to the church today. I know many wonderful churches who proclaim salvation by faith alone in Jesus Christ. Don't you? Can you just embrace that good news today? Thank you for listening. We have the seventh trumpet coming up, and I think you're going to enjoy that. I hope this was not too big, and I hope it's a blessing for you. I just wish you the very best today. Follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Thank you for listening.